I think it's pretty well established across the health sphere that insulin resistance leading to eventual diabetes is a major contributor to heart disease. But there are a lot of unanswered questions because while it's often assumed that the risk comes from high blood sugar, could it also be due to sugar's shadow, insulin? And if insulin is a factor in heart disease, is it always an issue if it's present or is it only an issue in particular contexts? Well, I wanted to find out because it was a point of discussion between Dr. Peter Atia and a diabetes researcher, Dr. Ralph DeFranzo, in a lengthy podcast on the topic of insulin resistance. So we'll listen in, but we'll also bring in some studies to identify what is what. Is all insulin atherogenic, meaning artery plaque promoting? As you pointed out, rightfully so, you know, I believe that high levels of insulin are also atherogenic. Now, I don't want people saying Dr. DeFranco said you shouldn't be giving insulin to people who need it. Of course, uh, if, if people need insulin, you need to give them insulin. But our beta cells make 35 units of insulin per day. If you're a type 1 diabetic, and again... Sir, what, what do you mean? Uh, so uh, you during the you're going to have your breakfast, you're going to yeah. have your lunch, you're going to have your dinner, and if oh, I were to add, so, I'm up, sorry, thirty five units. I yeah. thought you meant micro units. No. Got it. Yeah. So 35 over the total course units. of the yep. thirty five units of insulin. So we showed this many years ago, and I actually was at Yale that if you were to take a type one patient and they were lean, they would only need thirty five or forty units of insulin to get their uh, glucose controlled, assuming you gave the doses at the right time. But we have a lot of people who are taking 100 units of insulin, both type 1s and type 2s. So 3x physiologic. Yes. That kind of hyperinsulinemia, I think there's evidence to support that's atherogenic. So Dr. DeFranzo is of the mind that high insulin is atherogenic, again, increasing plaque formation in the arteries. And yet that creates a bit of an issue, right? Considering type 1 diabetics and in later stages type 2 diabetics are literally injecting insulin into themselves, are they injecting the very substance that will kill them? Well, Dr. Atia describes the conundrum. But now we have a problem, okay? Can you have the glucose remain high? Yeah, it's a question of do you want to die quickly or, or, or slowly? Because but we have really good drugs. Yes, today, yes, yes. But today, if, 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 if you were only doing this with insulin, be a problem. It's an awful trade off. It's, it's you're going to die very quickly from hyperglycemia if you're left untreated. But if we overdo it with insulin to maintain normal glycemia, we're going to kill you slowly. It's a quagma. You're stuck. Yep. You have to treat. But you also know that when you're giving these big doses of insulin, there may be some side effects. In the case of severe insulin resistance, not type 1 diabetes, it's true that a person can then avoid the insulin and die quickly because glucose, blood sugar, is no longer entering the cells, which means that the cells lose functionality or die from a lack of nutrients feeding them. Or the glucose glycates, sticks, and inhibits the many functional components of the cell, rendering the cell less functional. Or a person can inject insulin, and in this case, two to three times the normal amount of insulin, which, as we'll discuss, wreaks havoc on the body. It's really a pretty big quagmire. This is something, Ralph, I don't think that has been necessarily appreciated by the medical community, has oh, it? Absolutely not. Yeah. There has generally been an ethos of, when I've talked to patients with type 2 diabetes, um, that what they've been told is... I'm told to cover with as much insulin as is necessary yeah. to maintain my glucose levels uh, in this range. And it means I can eat whatever I want. It's okay if I have all the pasta and bread and sugar in the world, because as long as I'm covering it with insulin, I'm okay. And then you find out, wow, you're taking 150 units of insulin a day in all of its forms, the short acting, the long acting, et cetera. But, but I didn't actually realize that that what we would consider physiologic is 35. I, yes. I, I may have known that at one point and I've since forgotten, but yeah. that's a great reference. Yeah. So basically, if there's a person with type 2 diabetes listening to us today and they're taking 75 units that's of insulin, the, one of the takeaways should be, what do I need to do with my nutrition and other pharmacologic activities yep. plus exercise plus everything that's under my control to maybe get that down to 35 where I would be at a physiologic level. Right. So if a physician is focusing on only one half of the equation, the blood glucose, and not focusing on the insulin needed to get the blood glucose into the acceptable ranges, 
They're simply changing the poison, or at least that's the idea. But does it stack up to the scientific literature? Well, I did find a scientific review that discusses insulin resistance, including hyperinsulinemia. That's elevated insulin and the effect on plaque formation in the arteries. Now, unfortunately, the majority of the review focuses on insulin resistance, which is important, but doesn't answer our question about insulin itself. However, it does offer a few clues, like in this study. So to orient you, the researchers applied insulin at low and extremely high doses to smooth muscle cells. These cells are located here in the artery. They're responsible for direct blood pressure control, and they also migrate out of their resting place in the subendothelium in advancing forms of plaque formation to sit on top of the plaque. Okay, insulin directly to the cells. That's independent of insulin resistance, blood glucose, and so on. However, the researchers also genetically manipulated some of the smooth muscle cells to have massively diminished ability to produce the insulin receptor that sits in the cell membrane. So one condition has normal cells and the other is the same cells with a deficient insulin signaling, but they're both exposed to insulin. Here are the results. You can ignore the uh, top unless you're a molecular biologist, then well, have at it. For 99% of you, focus on the graph. We have added insulin in increasing concentration on the horizontal axis and we're measuring AKT activation. What is that? AKT is a famous protein, so famous that I got a selfie with it. Don't be too envious though. Anyway, it's a famous protein because it's heavily involved in insulin signaling. So if the lines go up, that means that there's more signaling through AKT. The wild type condition there are the normal cells and the L2 are the insulin receptor deficient cells. For those with a molecular biology degree, I'd call it a massive reduction, but not a complete knockout. Anyway, we see that uh, AKT is more strongly activated in the normal cells and might even increase with greater insulin exposure. This makes some sense since the L2 cells shouldn't be able to activate AKT. And yet, when we look at a cell signal that is tightly related to inflammation and cell migration, the script is flipped. The insulin receptor deficient cells have higher activation of a protein heavily implicated in atherosclerosis progression. Hmm, why might that be? Well, the researchers do show there's a greater cell migration, like that might be seen in atherosclerosis with the smooth muscle cells. But if the insulin receptor is greatly diminished, how is the cell reacting to this insulin? We'll get into that, but we need to discuss another study first, one that gets much closer to dividing the topic of insulin resistance and exposure to insulin as a whole. I promise I'll tie into what we just went over. I'll explain that later. This other study has been heavily referenced in the initial review. It's this one. I have to admit, I think this study is really clever. The researchers are manipulating simple physiology to uncover the real effect of insulin alone, but they aren't adding insulin like in the last study. They're letting the body raise blood insulin levels without killing the subject. Okay, what am I alluding to? The researchers are using genetically manipulated mice and they're using these mice for good reason. They're using APOE deficient mice, which means that these mice form plaque filled arteries at a much faster rate than normal. It allows the researchers to detect an effect in a much shorter amount of time. But that's not the only clever part. They also genetically manipulate one group of mice to be insulin receptor haploinsufficient, meaning only one of their insulin genes is able to produce functional insulin receptor. You see what this means. It means that these mice will have greater blood insulin levels around 50% more in their blood and that insulin will bind fewer insulin receptors, keeping the mice from dying from too low of blood sugar, yet still have the necessary hyperinsulinemia, so elevated insulin. This effectively separates the insulin resistance from the insulin itself, which is a really beautiful design. In addition, the mice were perfectly insulin sensitive. Again, marvelous design. So what happened? 
Did they develop plaque in their arteries at a faster rate? Well, look for yourself. The images are images of arteries excised from the mice. The left is the normal mice, and the delta there is the haploinsufficient mice. The red is plaque, and the graphs on the bottom are the average results across multiple mice. There's no difference. These data indicate that high insulin alone does not have an effect on atherosclerosis, and likely a person has to be insulin resistant to experience the detrimental effects of insulin on atherosclerosis. There's more to say on that to add context that we'll get to, but I'd like to return to the first primary study that we just went over and why cell migration was greater in cells with this massively produced insulin receptor. You would think there would be no effect, but it turns out that there is an effect that, as we saw. So why? Actually, before we uh, get to that, did you know that I have an even more science-packed version of this video that you're watching? You either screamed in horror or got very excited. If you're in the latter camp, it's true. I cover much more on these mechanisms of insulin and insulin resistance, including some more of what Dr. DeFranzo mentions, which is even counterintuitive to what we discussed, at least initially. If you're interested, check out the uh, full analysis video included with the Physionic Insiders. And if you really want to nerd out, join me in my live sessions where I dive even deeper into these topics and we can discuss and nerd out together. Also included with the Insider membership. Anyway, the link is in the description. I'll hope to see you there. Before I rudely interrupted with an advertisement for the Physionic Insiders, I asked, why is there an effect of cell migration, a component of atherosclerosis, in smooth muscle cells that are greatly reduced in their insulin receptor levels? Well, according to the researchers, it's believed, although research is ongoing, that in insulin resistance, cells will often reduce the expression of their insulin receptors, much like the artificially created in the study. However, another receptor becomes more prominent. That receptor is called the insulin-like growth factor receptor, or IGF-1 receptor. Now, there's a bit of complexity in this that uh, I'm gonna keep for the extended version because it's just too much to cover here. But insulin can also bind this IGF-1 receptor, and it will preferentially activate the ERK pathway, or the ERK pathway that we discussed earlier as well as instigate cell migration. We're making some assumptions here because we don't fully have the data to back that claim. So don't consider this foolproof. But it would explain one mechanism as to why insulin resistance in combination with insulin leads to increased atherosclerosis, so plaque progression, while insulin alone does not. Anyway, where does that land us on the question of insulin and being atherogenic, plaque promoting? Well, I don't think this is enough evidence to completely absolve insulin, but it at least begins to offer us evidence that the insulin molecule isn't inherently harmful. The context likely matters more than the molecule itself. So no, the injections of physiological insulin used in type 1 diabetics is unlikely to enhance plaque formation. But increasing doses used in later stages of type 2 diabetes and even pancreatic production with prediabetes are more than likely contributing to plaque formation since context is long-standing insulin resistance. That can be fixed, though, a variety of ways, from exercising, which is incredibly powerful in blood glucose and insulin management, but also nutrition, weight loss, low-carb diets, plant-based diets, and everything in between that focuses away from processed hypercaloric foods can have a tremendous effect. Or, Dr. DeFranzo mentions a triple therapy that's cheap and powerful that he uses with people with severe insulin resistance. I cover that all in this follow-up here. See you over there.